I'm going to turn to the hymn 366 for our opening hymn this evening. I thirsted in the barren land of sin and shame and nothing satisfying there I find. I think we all will sing better on our feet and we'll stand as we sing this opening hymn. 366, standing together. That's all stand. Shall we bow together, please, in the attitude of prayer and seek the Lord's face for his blessing. Let's encourage each one to talk to the Lord, ask the Lord for a word in season for your soul. If you're saved tonight, you have something to rejoice in. Ask the Lord to reveal himself afresh to you and give you cause to praise him if you're not saved, especially if you're not saved, you should be praying, Lord, speak to my heart. Give me the sense, the wisdom to seek the Lord while he may be found. Let's talk to the Lord. Our eternal God, our gracious Father in heaven, it's very humbling to think that we can bow before thy Thrice holy throne of grace, acknowledging that thou art God. Beside thee there is none else. Thou art the God who spoke this universe into existence. Thou art the God who formed man out of the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Ah, but then when man fell into sin, we recognize just the kind of God we have, because thou hast provided a saviour in Christ the Lord. We recognise sin separates us from thyself. Thou art a God so holy, can't even think of sin, let alone commit sin. Thou art a God who must judge sin, but rather than judge the sinner, for his wrongdoing. It pleased thee to put to death, a cruel death, thine only begotten Son, the one who knew no sin, sending him into this world where he took upon himself our sin and shame, and bearing that shame, scoffing rude, in our place, condemned he stood. But we rejoice tonight 
He sealed our pardon with his blood. We thank thee that God so loved the world that he gave. Gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him, not in themselves, not in some church, not in some pious activity, not in some religion of good works or church affiliation, rather believeth in him and his marvelous finished work at Calvary. Should not perish, but have everlasting life. Oh, we thank the Lord that salvation is free tonight to the whosoever will. We're glad to know from thy word that it's not thy will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. We, we have to recognize, though the world doesn't recognize it or doesn't want to know about it, but we have to acknowledge we've all been born in sin and we're undeserving of the least of thy mercies. Yet it has pleased thee to spare us. We think, Lord, of the the years so many of us ran away from thee. We, we went after the things of this old world with no concern for our own soul's eternal well-being. Had we died earlier in life, we might we would have been lost. We'd be in a lost eternity tonight, but because of thy love for us and thy great grace, it pleased thee to open our, our eyes to see our condition, to see Christ as the answer to the soul's great need. We thank thee for his marvelous work there at Calvary, where he gave himself as a ransom. And the sacrifice of his own self has satisfied divine justice. And because of him, we have hope tonight. Thank you, Lord, there is life for a look at the crucified one. We thank thee for every believer in this gathering who can look back to that day or night in their experience when they came as poor, guilty, hell-deserving sinners. We sought the Lord, we called upon thy name, and the promise of thy word is, whosoever shall call upon the Lord shall be saved. Simple as that. And we thank the Lord for the grace to come and for those who have called, for those who know now that it is well with their soul, all because of Christ. We rejoice there's nothing left for us to do. Salvation is not of works lest any man should boast. But Christ could say in his final words upon the cross, finished, the work is done. All we have to do is receive it by faith. Thank you for the gift of God, which is eternal life. And Lord, our hearts go out tonight to the many in this province, I maybe even in this very community, many who are, are, are going through life blissfully, perhaps unaware of their need, drifting on from day to day with no preparation made for eternity. And if the death angel shall come this hour, they'll be cut off, they'll be lost forever. Lord, we don't want that to happen. We're glad to know it's not thy will that it should happen, but that sinners should come to repentance. And our prayer is, wilt thou not give that gift of repentance even in this meeting time? If there's one bowed now before thee who doesn't know the Savior, doesn't know the joy of sins forgiven, can't read his titles clear to mansion in the glory, has no hope for eternity, well, give that needed grace, we pray. Bring that dear one, maybe somebody who's been prayed for for years, bring that dear one tonight to an end of himself. And we pray that the grace will be given and might close in with thine offer of mercy. On this meeting, we pray, Bless the singing of these grand old hymns, the reading of thy word, our meditation upon it. We pray that thou wilt own it all for thy glory. The end result will be that Christ might be magnified even in the salvation of precious souls. What we pray for this meeting, we pray for every sister congregation, every gathering where people are assembled at this hour around thy word. Prosper that truth, we pray of thee. Thou hast promised thy word shall not return unto thee void. We ask thee to save the lost. Restore the backslidden in heart. Bless all who have gathered in this house. Bless those, Lord, who would dearly love to be here but can't. We pray for those who are unwell, and we remember thy servant, Mr. Henderson. Pray especially for him, Lord, that thy hand would be upon him for good, that he might know the touch of the great physician. And others, Lord, who, again, would dearly love to be able to come out, but because of infirmity of one kind or another, are unable to attend. Meet with them, we pray thee. Bless them in their own souls as they meditate on the things of God. May they, may they know thy sweet presence. May the peace of God reign in their hearts. 
The joy of the Lord be their abiding portion. We look to thee. Come, bless and own the meeting for thy glory. We offer our prayer with thanksgiving. In Jesus' name, amen. I had thought to sing the hymn 249. I understand you might not be that familiar with it. 249, whoever receiveth the crucified one, whoever believeth on God's only Son. Uh, could I ask for a show of hands, who knows the hymn? Ah, we have some. Well, I tell you, you never learn anything but not trying, so we'll, we'll give it a go, brother. Play, maybe play over the first verse for us, and, uh, and then we'll, we'll try it and we'll see how we get on. We'll give it a go. Let's stand together, please. not have been perfect, but you'll know it better the next time you try to sing it. I invite you to turn, please, for a scripture reading. As it happens, we're in the book of Isaiah tonight again, Isaiah chapter 49. <clears throat> Isaiah 49 reading a few verses from the opening verse. 
Notice what the first word is. Listen. Listen, O isles, unto me, and hearken, ye people from far. The Lord hath called me from the womb. From the bowels of my mother hath he made mention of my name. And he hath made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand hath he hid me, and made me a polished shaft. In his quiver hath he hid me, and said unto me, Thou art my servant, O Israel, in whom I will be glorified. And I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for naught and in vain. Yet surely my judgment is with the Lord and my work with my God. And now, saith the Lord, that formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob again to him, though Israel be not gathered, yet shall I be glorious in the eyes of the Lord, and my God shall be my strength. And he said, it is a light thing that thou shouldest be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved of Israel. I will also give thee for a light to the Gentiles that thou mayest be my salvation unto the end of the earth. Thus saith the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel, and his Holy One to him whom man despiseth, to him whom the nation abhorreth, to a servant of rulers, kings, shall see and arise, princes also shall worship, because of the Lord that is faithful, and the Holy One of Israel, and he shall choose thee. Thus saith the Lord, In an acceptable time have I heard thee, and in a day of salvation have I helped thee. I will preserve thee, and give thee for a covenant of the people to establish the earth, to cause to inherit the desolate heritages. That thou mayest say to the prisoners, Go forth, to them that are in darkness, show thyself. They shall feed in the ways, and their pastures shall be in all high places. They shall not hunger nor thirst, neither shall the heat nor sun smite them. For he that hath mercy on them shall lead them, even by the springs of water shall he guide them. Amen. We're ending there at that tenth verse. We know the Lord will add his own blessing to the public reading of his word. At this point, I'm going to ask our brother, Mr. Andrew Bell, if you bring to us some necessary announcements, please. Thank you. everybody again in their place in the gospel service. You're very welcome and particular if you're visiting with us. We extend to you a special warm word of welcome. And again, we are once again delighted to have Reverend Graham McLaren with us this evening and join his ministry this morning. And we know that the Lord will bless us through his word to us tonight. Wednesday night is the prayer meeting and Bible study at 8 p.m. It takes the form of a deputation meeting. Uh, the Reverend Ray Cascaden will be along to talk about his work and travel to the uh, church in Uganda. So if you can be there, if at all possible, be in your place on Wednesday night. The offering of previous weeks for the Trinitarian Bible Society came to £400, of which we give you thanks. Friday night is Youth Fellowship Night, and this Friday night we're travelling to uh, Market Hill, it's an earlier start than normal, so if you could be here at 6.30, no later than 6.30 uh, on Friday uh, evening, um, that time is to be confirmed, but if there's a change in it, you'll be contacted 6.30 uh, on Friday evening, travelling to Market Hill. So again, be in your place and join with us. Next Lord's Day, Sable School and Bible Class is at 10.45. Morning worship at 12 noon, preceded by the time of prayer at half past 11, evening gospel service at 7 p.m., preceded by the prayer meeting at 6.30 in the hall. Next week, we're looking forward for the Reverend Henderson to be back with us. He'll be leading the meeting in the morning, uh, and the Reverend McLaren uh, has very kindly offered uh, to speak to us in the morning, and then the Reverend Henderson will be preaching in the evening. Next Sunday is the maintenance fund, and then for the week, in terms of meetings, the plan committee meeting has been uh, postponed and to be rearranged for another, another time. And the gospel bus planning meeting for those who are involved in the work will be at half past seven on Thursday evening 
here in the church hall. Do pray, of course, for the beginning of the Gospel Bus meetings. There are cards there in the porch. Take a copy, take one, more than one if you, if you so desire, uh, and pray over it for the work. And encourage, if you know children, grandchildren, whatever, and they could be along to these meetings, you encourage them to come. And, of course, continue to pray for the Gospel Mission planned in September here in the Church Hall as well. The literature I mentioned this morning, there's still uh, lots of material there on the, the porch. Take your copies. Most of the material is free. The books uh, are, are there and the prices are, as already have been mentioned, the, the, the book by the Reverend David Park is £10. The little book by David Lydon is priced at £2. Do continue to pray for those that are sick. Thank you again, Andrew, for the announcements and words of welcome. Uh, thank you all for your encouragements today. And uh, I have to say, very encouraged this evening at the number in the prayer time before the service. Uh, some people think the minister just walks up to the pulpit and it all happens, it just flows, it doesn't. You have no idea how much a minute preacher depends on the prayers of God's people. And it's very encouraging to see so many in the prayer time before the service. If you want a word from the Lord, then you need to come with hearts prepared and seek his face for a blessing. You want the Lord to work in the midst, we have to pray. And these are awful times we are living in. And uh, there's need, there's much need for prayer, for God to come and do a work even in our province. So thank you for your prayerful support. And uh, may the Lord bless you and continue to make it to be a blessing. I was commending your organist this morning on, on the way he plays and the way you sing. It did my heart good. I've been in meetings where uh, you feel like the, the handbrake is stuck on the organ and um, oh, they just need a good G up. But I, I was very encouraged this morning. I was blessed uh, through his playing and your singing and we rejoice in that. Keep it up and um, may the Lord bless you. Uh, speaking of singing, we're going to turn to the hymn book again for our offering hymn 287. <clears throat> 287, Depth of Mercy, Can There Be Mercy Still Reserved for Me? We'll remain seated for the first part of the hymn as your offering is received. 287.
I invite you to turn, please, to that passage we were reading, Isaiah 49. And a few thoughts from the, the verse 8 of the chapter. Thus saith the Lord, In an acceptable time have I heard thee, and in a day of salvation have I helped thee. And I will preserve thee, and give thee for a covenant of the people to establish the earth, to cause to inherit the desolate heritages. With God's word open before us, let's just unite our hearts for a moment in prayer. I do pray, beloved, that the Lord would come and speak to all of our hearts. Our loving Father, we thank Thee that we have the Scriptures of Truth. We're able to open them, read them. And we look to Thee that Thou will come and open the Scriptures to our hearts and open our hearts to the Word. We ask, Lord, for help from the sanctuary. We pray that thou wilt take the frail vessel of clay, grant us the infilling of thy Holy Spirit with wisdom. Make us just to be a channel of blessing, Lord. Cause something of thy word to get home to that dear soul for whom Christ has died. Oh, give the gift of repentance and faith, we pray thee. Lord, help us to believe in what we're about this evening. We're here that poor souls might learn something of their need and of a Savior's dying love. And we pray that thou wilt touch hearts. Maybe, maybe some, Lord, know the, the gospel. They've heard it so often. They know it so well. Yet have never come to take that step. May this be the night. We pray you'll defeat the devil. We know the kind of obstacles he puts in the way. And we ask, Lord, that thou wilt just do something of thyself that no preacher can do. Speak to that dear heart. Give the gift of repentance and faith. May there be a closing in with thine offer of mercy. Remember this dear man who's been mentioned, who's in hospital. We, we pray for him. Bless this dear man. We ask, Lord, that thy presence, the peace of God that passes all understanding, might be his portion. And for his family, for those who are concerned about him. Oh, may they know that around about and underneath are the everlasting arms. Bless them at this time, we pray thee. And in all things, glorify thy son, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You don't need me to remind you of the kind of chaos this world is in this evening. We were chatting around the dinner table today with some of the family and uh, some mention was made of Walt Disney. My parents have no problem setting their children down to watch a Disney cartoon. I'm given to understand that if you look closely at what is shown, in there there's abundant evidence of satanic behavior, even in children's programs. Children today are being robbed, you will know, of the right to discipline. A child was asked recently in a children's meeting, uh, what happens if you do something wrong? Does, does mommy send you to the naughty step? And he said, there is no naughty step these days. It used to be the rod was brought out. When I was a youngster, I did something I shouldn't have done. The stick was brought out and I felt the weight of it. And it didn't do me any harm. This book says, thou shalt use the rod. They talk about child abuse. Children are being abused because they're robbed of the right to discipline. And if they're not disciplined, if they're not corrected when they make mistakes or do something deliberately wrong, and you never have to teach a child to do wrong, sure you don't, it's in them. They're sinners. Can't help it. And you correct them today, and you're the one at fault. The, the world, we've reached that stage where good is evil, and evil is good. And men and women, this is a day when we need to be crying to God. Because we have growing up a generation 
who don't know the Lord, who will not be encouraged to seek the Lord. I, I don't know what the future of this province is. I fear for my grandchildren. I don't know what kind of a life they're going to have to face, what future days are going to bring if God doesn't step in and do something in this land of ours. This nation, this world of ours, is determined to get to hell. It's as simple as that. It's as serious as that. Anybody who talks sense these days is ridiculed and outlawed. The Lord is taking note of it all. Men today have no thought for their own soul's eternal well-being. People don't care these days if they even have a soul. Many are probably not even aware. They have a soul that needs to be saved. But God knows. And we, we always exhort people to, to seek the Lord for the gift of repentance while they still can, while you have breath in your body. It's too late when a person's dead and gone. It's too late then to worry about getting saved. I'm sure in, in this meeting house, you've been shown time and time again of the need to make ready for eternity. There is a time when you can be saved. There may also come a time when it's too late. Genesis 6 and 3 said, God says, My spirit shall not always strive with man. And a man is brought to realize he's a sinner. He needs to be saved. I accept a man be born again. He cannot see the kingdom of God. That's God's word. And it's a truth that everybody's familiar with. But familiarity breeds contempt. And too many are just careless about these things. But God's time, God's time is always now. Now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Not tomorrow. Not sometime in the hazy, distant future. Now. If God stops speaking to your heart tonight, you're doomed. If he is speaking to your heart, you'll be wise to seek him for salvation. This should be no ordinary service. This should be the opportunity that you seize upon to make ready for eternity. Because that's where you'll be forever. And there's no end. I'm sure you're well aware. Salvation is not of works. It's not to be found in good living, no matter how many multitudes of people believe that it is. Some people with the, the craziest notions as to where, how, where they'll be after they die. I heard a, a, a lady, I don't know if you ever watch Countdown in the afternoons. Maybe it's an old people's program, but I, I like it. There was a, they had this guest on in Dictionary Corner. I think it was last week. And uh, she talked about, she's a, a critic for, the, for restaurants. And she spends her time writing to, into newspapers about criticizing this restaurant, that restaurant. She's a food critic. Anyway, she was asked what would her meal be if this was her last day on earth. I forget what the dish was. Of, I think basically it was a bowl of porridge, is what she said. But she said, I, I would scoff that into me and I would sit back and wait for the meteor to come. The mind boggles. Where does she think she's going? And she's only one of millions. Now, this fanciful notion that whenever you die, and be out there somewhere and everything will be hunky-dory. Beloved, listen. If you're not saved by the grace of God, you'll be in God's, you'll be in, in hell with the devil and his angels. And it's interesting that God prepared hell for Satan and his angels. He didn't prepare it for you. But that's where you'll be if you die unsaved. But it's not the Lord's will that that's where you should be. That's why God, it, it, God so loved the world, we've quoted that already. He gave his only begotten son that if you would believe in him, you shouldn't perish, but of everlasting life. Haven't you heard it a thousand times? 
got a question for you. If you're not saved tonight, beloved, why not? What more can God do? I know some people are afraid to get saved. Afraid of what others will think. The fear of man brings us near. I know what it's like I've been there. I remember coming under conviction of sin at the age of 17. And that's when I discovered the, the devil's alive and well. And he said, you get saved, your friends will laugh at you. It was the end of April. It was 51 years next Sunday I got saved. But when I was 17, I came under conviction of sin. The devil said, friends will laugh at you. It was coming near the 12th of July. He says, you go out, with the, out to see the bands. People will not be looking at the bands. They'll be looking at you. You'll stick out like a sore thumb. <coughs> so I had to let that pass. The devil says, it'll be easier to get saved after the 12th. So I let it go. And then time went on. Next thing in my calendar was a Christmas party at a nurse's home. You'd wonder why it would take young fellas to a nurse's home. But the devil says, listen, you get saved. You'll not enjoy the nurse's party. They'll laugh at you. Leave it to the new year. So I did. And I went through six years of that. 12th of July. Christmas. Easter Monday was the first motorbike race of the season and I wouldn't have missed Kirkuson for anything. The devil says that the crowds will be looking at you. They'll not see the bikes. Uh, that's the way it was. Till God came and spoke to me. April 1972. God says, my spirit shall not always strive with man. And I knew it was coming my time. I had heard the gospel and brought up in a Christian home. I was approaching my 23rd birthday. I knew I mustn't start another year of my life. I get right with God. And by the grace of God, I got saved on my birthday. So I have two birthdays in one day. But listen, if God stops speaking to you tonight, you are doomed. There's no, there's no remedy. You miss God's call. I hadn't planned to say that, but it has happened. Looking at this passage of Scripture here, consider that God loves you. People think God is... He's some sort of a, a big ogre sitting up there in the sky just waiting to bring his rod down and judgment upon everybody's head. He's not. God loves you. He's proved that by sending Christ to Calvary. We don't deserve that. There's not one of us ever deserved to be saved. Did I not say this morning, if we had our rights, we'd be in hell already. But God doesn't want that. And, and, and people run away from the Lord and they run away from salvation and they, 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 they just don't want the Lord in their lives. Why? What has this world got that's worth holding on to for what? A few more days? To end up in hell forever? Is that a good deal? When you, when you, when you compare... What the Lord promises. Compare that with a lost eternity. <laughs> it's, it's just no there's, no... there's no reason why anybody would miss heaven. Notice here, there's a thought of property here. In the middle of verse 8, the Lord says, I will preserve thee and give thee for a covenant of the people. When a soul is saved by the grace of God, and it's only by the grace of God, that person is brought into the family of God by the spirit of adoption. Our shorter catechism defines adoption as an act of God's free grace whereby we are received into the number and have a right to all the privileges of the sons of God. Isn't that something? We, we don't become a child of God by infant baptism. 
I grew up in a denomination where they taught me that because they sprinkled a taste of water on my forehead, that made me a child of God. And then when I was about 14, I was confirmed and they said, you've received the Holy Spirit. There's no foundation for that in this book. That's a lie. That's a deception. And a lot of people believe it. And thankfully, as I said, I was brought up in a Christian home and I knew it wasn't the truth. But I, I, I went through those things. But it didn't do anything for me. I remember coming out of the confirmation service and a, a fellow that I run about with, he was confirmed the same night. He says, well, how do you feel now you've got the Holy Spirit? I says, I don't feel a bit different because I haven't got it. And he looked at me. It's, it's a deception. And too many are taken in by it. We understandably, when we're saved, we are expected to live for the glory of God. And that's a privilege. 1 Corinthians 6.20 reminds us that you're bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God. So when you're saved, you become the Lord's property. That's a precious thing. What many don't perhaps realize is that Christ becomes your possession when you get saved. And the unsaved may say, well, sure, what, what, what do I want? Why, why, would I, why would I want Christ as my possession? <laughs> why would I want to be his possession? This Bible says, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he's none of his. So you need him. The Lord Jesus has the, the attribute of being uh, very God, but he also has the attribute, attribute of being the perfect man. And his attributes become the property of the believer when he receives Christ as a savior. Omnipotent, God has all power. Does that benefit you when, you're, when you get saved? Well, Paul says in Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. The Lord enables the believer to do things he would never have accomplished before he was saved. He'd give you power to overcome all those temptations that up until now you've fallen foul of. He'll give you the ability to resist the temptation to sin and to, to find rest and comfort. He'll give you the power to live above sin. These are gifts that God gives to those who trust him. And so this is not natural. It's just one of, uh, of many blessings you come to enjoy when you receive Christ. You don't have to worry about keeping God's salvation. God does the keeping. The Apostle Peter puts it like this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of the dead, the, sorry, the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible, an undefiled that fails not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God. So if you're not saved, don't worry about having to keep it. You don't have to do that. God keeps you. First John 4 and 8 reminds us that God is love. And again, that love is made available to you when you get saved. The love of God in your heart will, will help you to love him and therefore help you to hate sin. It'll help you to love that neighbor that you don't get on that well with. Oh, well, everything changes. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. And those old things that, that, that get you down, everything changes. There was a man, oh, years ago, he could neither read or write, but he heard the gospel and he gloriously saved it. In his simplicity, he trusted the Lord. And he was downtown one day and he, he noticed people, a, a big notice in a shop window. And it was a, drawing a lot of attention. And he, he didn't know what it, he couldn't read so he didn't know what it was. But he thought, if that, if that notice is getting a lot of attention, it must be important. So he got a piece of paper and, and he, he copied out what it said on the notice. And he went home and he got out a wee tin of paint. And he painted these, the, the words across the front of his t-shirt. And he went back downtown showing off his chest. You know what it said? Under new management. He found the Lord. He was a new creature. And when people asked him what it meant, he was able to give a word of testimony. 
It may seem impossible to you at present, but you trust Christ to save you, you'll discover your whole heart's affection will change. And change for the better. Nobody ever regrets trusting Christ. Such will be the change in you. You'll wonder why you ever spent so long running away from him and trying to find life in the things of this world. When you think of it, all that Christ is becomes part of you. He is God, yet he comes by his Holy Spirit and lives within you. That's marvelous. That's, it's, a, it's a blessed experience. Ask anybody who's saved. Do they ever want to go back to the world? Oh, a thousand times no. Furthermore, he comes to you as the perfect man. All he has in his perfect nature becomes yours. As a perfect man, he fulfilled all the law of God. He died for your sin. Not his own, he couldn't sin. But he became sin for you. He never became a sinner. He became sin in order to bear the judgment that was due to you and me for our sin. It's called substitution. It's a marvelous thing. In Matthew 3, 17, it's recorded that God spoke from heaven and said of the Lord Jesus, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Wouldn't you like God to say that of you? Well, he will if you receive Christ because you become part of him. He becomes part of you. You see, there's not a single virtue that Christ has, but it's imputed to you when you receive him to be your savior. His perfect righteousness becomes yours. If you know anything about Abraham, you'll know that God promised to send him a son, uh, even in his old age. The man was about 100. His wife Sarah was 90. And in spite of what was considered humanly impossible, God nevertheless wrought it for his servant. We're told in Romans 4, 18 to 22, that against hope, Abraham believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead when he was about 100 years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully persuaded that what he had promised he was able also to perform, and therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. Listen, God specializes in impossibilities. And no matter how far down in sin a man may be, he's never that far down that the Lord can't reach him. Don't care what his past may be. If he comes as a poor sinner and acknowledges, I need a savior, the Lord is able and willing to save God had given Abraham the promise and God keeps his promise. And Abraham's belief in God's promise was accredited to him as righteousness. Beloved, God's promise to you is come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. I will give you rest. I put it to you, beloved, as long as you're running after the things of the world, you have no peace. You can try and fool yourself, but you have no peace. But you trust Christ to be your Savior. To put your dependence on him. And you put your head on the pillow tonight. And you'll sleep like you never slept before. Well, maybe the excitement will keep you awake. But you'll be so blessed. You can go to sleep knowing that if you don't waken in this scene of time again, you're waking in glory. What do you do? Take the Lord at his word. These things you may have because of God's omnipotence. He's all powerful. There's so many things about Christ's life that become yours when you trust him to save you. There's one important matter you need to consider before we move on, and that is the death of Christ becomes yours too when you receive him as your savior. By that we mean he enables you to die to sin and to self and to live unto righteousness. 
Romans 6 and 4. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. And see, this is the beauty of trusting Christ. You start to live. That's why it's talk, that's why it's referred to as being born again. You're born from above. The Lord puts new life in you. This world would put a new suit on a man and, and think that it, they've changed him. But the Lord puts a new man in the suit. And that's the difference. So we not only die in him, we're raised up again to live in him. Colossians 2, 13 and 14. You, being dead in your sins, and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Underline the word all. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Beloved, when you receive Christ as your Savior, it's as if you'd never sinned. Because every last transgression is blotted out. The record book is clear. No charges can be held against you because they're nailed to the cross. That, beloved, is the, mess, is the wonder of the gospel. Why would any man or woman not want to enjoy such a marvelous deliverance, not just from sin, but from the consequences of sin? This glorious freedom, this mighty deliverance, can be yours by simply receiving it by faith. It can be yours now. Why? Why would you run the risk of missing heaven for, for what? A few more days in sin? Notice, second to hear the purpose, notice what this eighth verse says, Thus saith the Lord, in an acceptable time I have heard thee, in a day of salvation I have helped thee, and I will preserve thee and give thee for a covenant. Now this covenant is, is God's promise to the sinner that he will save him if he'll trust him for this great salvation. Christ is in the covenant. All that God the Father has, he has given to his Son, and all that is in the Son becomes yours when you receive his Son as your Savior. Now think about that. All that Christ, all that is in Christ becomes yours when you trust him for salvation. So what is there in Christ that can be yours? Well, there's atonement for a start. What's atonement? It's a covering over of your sins. They'll never be seen anymore. David sinned against the Lord in the matter of adultery, but he prayed, have mercy upon me, O God. According to thy loving kindness, according to the multitude of thy mercies, blot out my transgressions. You have that in Psalm 51. And God did. Because David was able to say, I acknowledged my sin unto thee, and mine iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and thou forgivest the iniquity of my sin. Black and white. Beloved, you can't hide your sin from the all-seeing eye of God. But if you confess it and honestly seek his forgiveness, he will forgive, provided, of course, you're prepared to finish with it. There's no use praying. I, I've had people say to me time and time again, oh, I say my prayers. That's very good. But there's no point in saying, Lord, Lord forgive me for my sin. And tomorrow you're going to go back and do the same thing over again. That's not Repentance. You come in, mercy, in, in, in repentance before God, willing to have done with sin, that sin that's taking you to hell. You're prepared to finish with it and take Christ at his word. He has promised he'll forgive, he'll blot it out. Your sins will be cast into the sea of God's forgetfulness, never to be remembered against you anymore. Where would you get a gospel like that? While we're thinking of covenant here, 
Hebrews 10, 16, 17 says, God says, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds will I write them and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. How often have you heard somebody say, if you're burying the hatchet, don't leave the handle sticking out of the ground. When God buries your sins, they are buried. Even God won't remember them. Blotted out, Psalm 32, verse 1. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. That's atonement. If somebody wants to offend you, they might have trouble forgetting it. But when God forgives, God forgets. Which means that when you meet God one day, which we will do, you appear before him, and the record book shows no trace of your sin. That's what it is to trust Christ. However, uh, as we said, it would be a mistake to pray, Lord, forgive me, if you don't intend to give up your sin. There has to be a turning from it. But what a comfort it is to know that the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Now, the devil loves to misquote that verse. And many a believer is hounded by the devil. He comes along and he adds in the, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin but one. And the devil will rake up something from your guilty past. The devil's a liar. If God has forgotten your sin, you do the Lord an injustice by remembering it. He has blotted it out. It'll never be remembered against you again. That's the beauty of God's offer. Our redemption is in this covenant in Christ. Our righteousness is in this covenant for the simple reason that the righteousness of Christ becomes yours when you trust him. What's more, our eternal perfection is also in this covenant. Oh, we will never be perfect in ourselves, not in this scene of time, but beloved, when you're in Christ by faith, all his perfections are put on your account. And God accepts you as perfect because of Christ. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. To make you clean, to wash you, sanctify you, and to make you perfect in him. It's just wonderful. The hymn writer penned the words, Bold shall I stand in that great day, for who ought to my charge shall lay? Fully absolved through thee I am from sin and fear from guilt and shame. Somebody used the illustration of the a broken necklace. I'm sure you've seen a, a necklace, a string of beads, and, and if the cord's broken and the, the beads are all over the floor, the job gathering them up and getting them strung back together again. Listen, in this grand covenant of grace, string of pearls, Christ himself is the unbreakable cord that holds it all together. Take him out of the covenant and the pieces of it mean nothing. You can't have this salvation without having him. That's the thing. Which prompts two thoughts. There's no salvation outside of Christ. If you're to be saved, you've got to receive Christ. You can't be saved and not have him. <clears throat> which again emphasizes the thought, <clears throat> pardon me, that there has to be a finishing with sin. Too many want to consider themselves saved and ready for heaven, but they really don't want Christ to have any part in their life. That's not going to happen. To be saved is to quit with Satan and sin Take Christ as your Savior and be prepared to own him before this world. <clears throat> Ask any Christian who's been through times of difficulty. They'll tell you that when the clouds have gathered, the skies have darkened, the promises of God have stood them in good stead. <clears throat> Getting saved doesn't mean you'll never have problems. But it does mean you have somebody to share your problems with. You can cast all your care upon the Lord and know that he cares 
for you. This, this Bible is filled with promises. And the child of God delights to claim them and make them his own. And God never fails to keep his promises. This is something you can look forward to when you come to receive him as your own saviour. You have a personal friend, one that sticks closer than any brother. And let me ask you, uh, you're here tonight, if you're not saved, wh where do you turn in times of trouble? How many are seen to turn to alcohol or nicotine or drugs or something like that, looking for some means of escape from their, their situation? Of course, it only makes things worse for them, never solves the problem. And the word of God says, cast all your care upon him. Why? For he careth for you. You know, the way people, the way some people respond to the gospel invitation, you, you, you think the Lord was coming to do them an injustice. He's not. The Lord's coming to, to give you a, a life that's worth living. And yet people, people have this thing in their head that somehow it'll be like an, an affliction if I were to come to Christ. I wouldn't be able to do this or able to do that. Beloved, I put it to you. If you're not saved, you haven't even started to live yet. What you need to do is recognize your own ailment. Acknowledge there's a vacuum in your life that's not being filled. Recognize the discrepancy that this world has left you with. Admit that your life and the, the things of this world have shortchanged you. And you haven't found the fulfillment your soul desires and requires. Beloved, listen, turn your life over to Christ and let him meet you at the very point of your need. He's the great physician to heal the sin-sick soul. He's the only one can rid you of the guilt of sin and set you free. Cast yourself upon him. Know the joy of sweet relief. Because this, this is his promise to you, to bring you joy. All Satan will ever do is bring you misery. John six thirty seven to 40, the Lord Jesus says, All that the Father giveth me shall come to me. I think I've quoted it already. Him that cometh to me, I'll in no wise cast out. For I come down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will, which hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that every one which seeth the Son and believeth in me may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Do you see it, beloved? The whole plan of salvation is God's doing. It is not his will that you or I should perish, but that you should come to repentance and be fitted for heaven. God wants to bring you to heaven. Didn't we say at the start, he's not the big ogre there sitting up in the sky waiting to punish you. He's not. It's God's desire to have you in heaven, to share it with himself. And all those believers who have gone before. Why would you reject it? Why volunteer? Did we not say this this morning? Why volunteer for hell? When heaven's offered to you. On a golden platter. Well, what you know, you need to be saved. Jesus Christ is standing by waiting to save you. Why not come even now. Why not cast yourself? Upon? You'll never save yourself. Salvation is not of works. So it wouldn't matter how, how good a life you live. It'll not get you to heaven. It's by simply coming and acknowledging, Lord, I, I, I'm the poor sinner. I can't help myself. But I trust Christ to save me, to keep me, to fit me for heaven. You take the Lord at his word. And the onus is on God to keep his word. 
to keep you. He's never lost one yet. Why would you not trust him? What would, I, I don't know, what else can the Lord do? He's done everything necessary to make this salvation available to you. He offers it to you now. What are you going to do with it? The greatest gift. Well, if somebody come in the door and reached you a check for a million or two or three million, whatever, you'd grab it, wouldn't you? But you could die tomorrow and you'd have to leave it. But God is offering you something that millions would never buy. And it's free. And not only will you have it now, you'll have it forever, for all eternity. What are you going to do with God's offer? Free salvation. Will you take it this evening? Or are you going to say, nah, it's not for me. Oh, God give you grace to receive it. Come as a, just the way a child would. If you were to hold out a sweet to a child, say, this is yours if you'll come and take it. What do you think the child will do? You'd break your arm to get it, wouldn't it? Well, God's offering you something far sweeter. Eternal life. What are you going to do with it? And cast it back in his face. Or will you say, Lord, give me Christ. Give me this gift of everlasting life. Our time is gone. We'll not take time for closing him. Let's bow together in prayer. Let me say... If you are concerned, you know, you know your own heart. You know if you're not saved. And you know that God's willing to save you. If there's anything you're not sure about, would you, would, would you make it? Now, we'll not embarrass anybody. But if you're concerned, beloved, don't go away. Don't go away without Christ. Take him tonight. Take him at his word. Trust him for full salvation. Go on your way rejoicing. Start out for heaven and home. God give you grace to trust him. Our Father... We thank thee for thy lovely invitation. Thou hast said, come unto me. All ye that labor, they're heavy laden. I will give you rest. We pray thee, Lord, draw that dear soul to thyself. O oh, defeat the devil, we know the kind of obstacles he puts in the way. We pray that thou will give that needed grace that even this very hour, that dear soul there would come and receive Christ. Know the joy of sins forgiven. Go on their way rejoicing with a glad assurance that it is well with the soul. Bless thy word to this end we ask of thee. In Jesus' name, amen.